Hello everyone. Today is October 1st, 2019. This is part 12 of my video series, The Mystery of the Beast. And today's video is called The Image of the Beast. Before I get into it, I want to read to you what Jesus said to the second church in Revelation chapter 2, starting at uh, verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear, that you are, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil, the dragon, Satan, is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. For ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. The second death is going to come into play quite a bit later on in this series, but I want you to make note that it is mentioned here in chapter 2 of Revelation. But the main reason I wanted to read this letter today is that we need to change our eschatology. Most of what we have been taught is wrong. The book of Revelation has been totally misunderstood, misinterpreted. And so all of us have been waiting all our lives for some catastrophic three and a half year tribulation. The fact of the matter is, all of history has been tribulation since the time of Christ. We have to get that through our heads. We live in the wilderness. The wilderness is a time of tribulation. And to these people in Smyrna, they were about to go through some incredible persecution, tribulation that was going to lead to many deaths in their church. Now, what could be greater tribulation than that? We all fear, we've always feared this, this monstrous beast coming out of the sea. And then we've always feared this monstrous image to the beast that the false prophet has the people make. And so we've lived in this paradigm that has misunderstood what the Lord really is saying. Today we're going to understand what the image for the beast, the image to the beast, the image of the beast is. Now last time I taught that the beast that rises from the earth in Revelation chapter 13 beginning here in verse 11 then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It looks like a lamb. It has two little horns like a lamb. But yet it speaks like a dragon. Later on in the book of Revelation, this second beast is called the false prophet. Here we can understand why. Because he looks like a Christian, but he speaks like Satan. That has been the history of the church. The two horns, I think, and this was pointed out by uh, one of my listeners, the two horns represent the Catholic and the Protestant church. Remember Revelation or uh, Daniel chapter 7 which talks about a little horn that comes out and destroys three kings. And this little horn comes out at the time of the fourth kingdom that is shown to Daniel in chapter 7. And I've shown you now in a couple videos that that fourth kingdom 
that was shown to Daniel is the seventh kingdom. Remember the beast that rises from the sea here in Revelation 13 has 10 horns and seven heads. The seventh head is the seventh kingdom. That seventh kingdom is also the fifth kingdom that shows up in Daniel chapter 2, which is the toes of iron and clay. The clay, clay is the earth, the dust of the ground from which Adam was made by God. The beast that rises from the earth is that part of that vision. The iron part is the governmental part, the part that usually wields the sword, the steel sword, and all of the weapons of war. But both aspects come into play with respect to the seventh head of the beast. And that seventh head of the beast has been the head since around 500 AD and has ruled until now. The time under that beast's rule has been a time of severe persecution for anyone who wanted to live a righteous life. The righteous have been destroyed for the entire history of the world since the death of Jesus Christ, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The righteous are always the scum of the earth. The righteous are, are always the ones who are overlooked, always blacklisted, never invited. Everyone hates them because... They live a life, just the mere life they live points out the sin in other people's lives. So they're hated on account of Christ. This entire 2,000 years, this age, the church age, has been characterized by the destruction of the Kodeshim, by the destruction of the holy people of God. Now, in the Bible, the false prophet, the one that you see always brought up who represents the false prophet is Balaam. Remember Balaam? He was the one that Balak hired all the way back in the book of Numbers when Moses and his people were coming into the land of Israel. Chapter 25 of Numbers. Well, let's go back. Let's go back to um, 22. Then the people of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan at Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was in great dread of the people because they were many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, This horde will now lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pethor, which is near the river, in the land of the people of Ammah, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they are dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you, as the Lord speaks to me. The Lord. Balaam knew the Lord. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. And God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. 
and it covers the face of the earth. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go to your own land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Once again, Balak sent princes, more in number and more honorable than these. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor. And whatever you say to me, I will do. Come, curse this people for me. But Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. So Balaam says that he serves the Lord, that he serves God, Yahweh, Yahuwah. But then he says to them, so even though he says, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God, but he says to them, so you two please stay here tonight, that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. Now, how often do we do this? We pray about something that we really want. And God says no. And then... We might whine about it. We might mope about it. Something new might come to us that makes us think, oh, I really ought to do this. And so we pray some more. And finally, we feel that God is saying, okay, go ahead. Let's see what happens to Balaam when that happened. Verse 22. But God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with the drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made me a, made a fool of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand, then I would kill you. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey, on which you have ridden all your, day, all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you in this way? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed down and fell on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to oppose you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside before me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely just now I would have killed you and let her live. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you stood in the road against me. Now, therefore, if it is evil in your sight, I will turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only the word that I tell you. So Balaam went on with the princes of Balak. The story goes on for a couple more chapters. And then... He, Balaam is asked to curse Israel, and God only allows Balaam to bless Israel. 
three times, four times. And then right after this, it says, after he prophesied all these four times, it says, Balaam rose and went back to his place, and Balak also went his way. Next we read this. While Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. So they're worshiping Baal. They're worshiping a false god. Israel is. Okay? With the daughters of Moab. They began to whore with the daughters of Moab. So they began to have sexual relations with the women of Moab. Was that a chance occurrence? If we look at other scriptures where Balaam's name occurs, we see Numbers 31, 16, which says, Behold, these on Balaam's advice caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And so the plague came upon the congregation of the Lord. So Balaam, ad Balaam advised Balak, the king of Moab, how to get to Israel. God would not curse Israel through Balaam. Balaam could only bless them. But don't you think there was a little bit of a uh, transfer of money at this advice? So Balaam wanted the money. And in exchange for that money, Balaam told Balak how Moab could hurt, possibly even destroy Israel through sin, through sexual sin, and through worshiping a false god. Deuteronomy 23, 5 says, But the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam. Instead, the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loved you. Joshua 13, 22 says this, Balaam also, the son of Beor, the one who practiced divination, was killed with the sword by the people of Israel among the rest of the slain. Then we move into the New Testament. In the book of 2 Peter, chapter 2, as Peter is discussing people who sin, he says they forsake the right way. They have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. Balaam was paid for his wicked advice. Jude 1.11 says, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain, who killed his brother, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain, for money, to Balaam's error, and perished in Korah's rebellion. Revelation 2.14 really tells us what Balaam's error is. In Revelation 2.14, He's talking to the church of Pergamum. He says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. 
Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. Two great sins of Balaam. Eating food sacrificed to idols and engaging in sexual immorality. Now, most people do not understand what food sacrifice to idols is. Here in the account of what Israel did right after Balaam went to Balak, you see that the people did bow down to Baal. And they probably literally ate food that had been sacrificed to the idol, to Baal. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul speaks about food sacrificed to idols. But you have to read that in its context to understand what he's really talking about. Now, I don't have time to get into that, I've written an entire book on it called When We Awake. But I do want to take you to Hebrews chapter 13 so that you can understand this concept because it's it's absolutely critical if you ever want to understand the Word of God and if you want to understand why and how things have gotten so crazy, you need to understand this concept. Hebrews 13, verse 7 says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, if you want to know who Jesus Christ is, read the book of John because the book of John is the book of I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father unless he comes through me. I am living water. I am the bread of life. You must eat my body and drink my blood or you have no life in you. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Okay, those come from the book of John. Now, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, here's the key. Verse 9. Remember this verse. Hebrews 13, 9 says, Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. Doctrine. Do not be led away by diverse and strange doctrine. Teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Do you see what this author did, what the writer of Hebrews did here. He went from the word teachings and morphed it or translated it into the word foods. Food. What is your food? What do we feed upon? That's why Jesus was so adamant that our eye be single, that we take care what we put into our eyes. And that goes for our ears as well. But the whole doctrine of food and why there was this differentiation of clean and unclean foods in the Old Testament, the different types, you know, beef was clean, sheep, clean animals, because they had the cloven hoofs and they chewed the cud, but a pig was not clean. It only had one of those characteristics. Why was there that distinction? It was to teach us through a parable. All of scripture is a parable and it's written 
to show us prophetic spiritual truth. Now, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9, the author tells us teachings equal food. Doctrine equals food. The doctrine that you listen to day in and day out, that you go to church and hear, that you read in your book from your favorite Christian author or whoever your favorite author is, that that teaching, that doctrine is your food. So what it then is a food sacrifice to an idol? You've got to be, you have to be honest with yourself now. What are the idols of your heart? What are the things you love? What are the secret things you love that you don't tell anybody about? What do you look at? What do you read? What do you think about? What do you listen to? What food are you taking in to your heart? Balaam, the false prophet, taught the people to eat food sacrificed to idols. He taught them to accept false doctrine. That's one of the marks of the false prophet. They teach false doctrine and they teach you to accept false doctrine. Secondly, they teach you to engage in sexual immorality. Why is sexual immorality so prevalent in the church today? Why do we have churches who have raised people up into pastorships and bishoprics, leaders of seminaries who support abortion, who engage in homosexual activity, who engage in pedophilia? Why have we allowed it? Why do we stay in their churches? Well, let's see what is the image to the beast? Revelation 13. Verse 11, then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. So this is the false prophet, both Catholic church and Protestant churches. Look Christian, speak like the devil. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of man and his number is 666. Everybody believes that the beast is coming. Everybody believes that this second beast, the false prophet, is coming, that he's the Antichrist. That's what most people believe. He is the Antichrist who speaks for the beast government. Everybody fears this image of the beast that 
is going to be created. And everybody fears the mark of the beast that they're going to force on our hands and upon our heads. But let me tell you, the second beast, the beast that rises from the sea and the second beast that rises from the earth, the false prophet, have been with us for 1,500 years and are still with us. The image of the beast has been with us for 1,500 years. What is it? What could it be? Why don't we see it? Why don't we recognize it? Let me read what I wrote a week ago. The false prophet has two horns like a lamb but speaks like a dragon. The horns represent the Catholic and Protestant churches. The false prophet tells the people to make an image for the beast. The images they make <clears throat> are their physical church buildings. Look at the demonic gargoyles on the medieval European churches and the phallic symbol steeples on many Protestant churches. Look at the serpent-inspired chapel at the Vatican called Audience Hall. <clears throat> Since I mentioned that here, let's go ahead and look at that. Here's some pictures of gargoyles. Here, an alien gargoyle on Paisley Abbey, Scotland. The church was built in the early 14th century. Look at that. What about this? The devil in person. Gargoyle on the Magdalen College in Oxford. Here, Salisbury Cathedral. You've got this demonic thing biting what appears to be a man on the church and then look at this alien gargoyle at chapel de bethlehem bethlehem chapel in nantes and then here's another picture gremlin gargoyle at the same chapel bethlehem chapel look at these things Here is a half dragon, half chicken gargoyle in Switzerland. What are these entities doing on church buildings? Oh, well, that's medieval time, you say. Okay, let's go to modern times. Let's look at a, something just built within our lifetime, at least my lifetime. Audience Hall. What does that look like? Scales, eyes, fangs. And right up here is where the Pope sits. Here's a snake head. And looking at the outside of that audience hall, that's what that looks like. And then look at this statue that's inside it. Here's the Pope in audience hall. Here's a statue behind him. And this is supposed to be a statue of Christ, Jesus Christ. Now look, here you see the face of Christ. But what's this thing growing out of his head? It looks like a serpent's head to me. What about to you? Look again. Looks like a serpent. Here, it, here you are back. It's like you're looking into the eyes and the face and the fangs of a serpent. And that's how they made audience hall where the Pope speaks to the people. Look at this picture, this 
statue of Christ is so utterly, utterly bizarre. Look at this. Look at that. It's supposed to be Jesus Christ. And look at this. Dragon coming off of his head. Well, isn't that interesting? Here it is. Here's the Pope. Looks like Benedict to me. Look at that. Look at that. How can anyone worship in a church that looks like that? How can anybody respect a man, a Pope, who sits beneath that in a hall that looks deliberately like a serpent, that was made to look like a serpent. And what is the serpent? The serpent is the dragon that we see in Revelation chapter 12. The beast that rises from the sea in Revelation chapter 13 looks just like that serpent. It's described the very same way. And then we have a beast that rises from the earth who has the people, who deceives the people, the people. The people make this image. They made that image. The people make the churches that you go to, that I've gone to. The people make the churches, they make the statues, they make the gargoyles, they make the serpent. They make the church look like a serpent. They make it look like the beast. They make it look like the dragon. And then what about the rest of the prophecy of Revelation chapter 13? Well, I continued writing on September 26th. People believe that churches are alive, that they have breath in them. The false prophets work demonic miracles in them, even calling fire down from heaven, thus fooling and deceiving the people. I left the church in 1993, right around the time that you heard of the Toronto blessing. And I think this something, Brownsville, Pensacola, or something like that going on. Sparkling gold coming down from heaven, holy laughter, howling like dogs. Those were supposed to have been manifestations of the Holy Spirit. They were not. They were not manifestations of the Holy Spirit. The image for the beast speaks and causes those who will not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Where does the false prophet speak? The false prophet speaks at church. So the image for the beast speaks. He preaches a word from the dragon, a satanic word that causes men to worship the image of the beast, to worship their church. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast. The beast seems alive. Okay, that reminds me of a scripture I need to read here. I believe it's Revelation chapter 3. Another word to one of the seven churches. Let me just put two and three in here at the same time, so in case I need to go back.
Revelation 3 to the church of Sardis. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. The church seems alive because of these false miracles, because of the false prophets, because of the works through the demonic, through the false prophets. The church seems alive. And because the people do not have discernment of spirits and they do not know the word of God, they never know when they're being lied to and deceived. Now this is a critical distinction. The false prophet does not get the people to worship the beast itself. It deceives them into worshiping the church. The beast always gets you to worship the church. But the church is made in the image of the beast. Isn't, isn't your church the best church? I know when I was going to church, even when I started back in 1978, 79, our church was the most anointed church. Our church was the most spiritual church. Um, or the only true church. I went to a Bible college and uh, was at a seminary where there were two, kind of two different divisions of this particular church. And I remember there was uh, a young man there from the other division and we were in some conversation. I said, well, we're, we're brothers. And he looked at me and said, I don't know that we are. So, see, he belonged to the other division, and they were the only true church. Or your church is the only church you can belong to if you really want to be assured of your salvation. And so... It was allowed to give breath. The beast that rises from the earth was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast through his false prophecies. He makes it seem alive so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the church to be slain. Now, how many times have we heard in the name of the church, for the sanctity of the church, for the good of the church, which makes it sound like it's for the good of the people. It's good for all of us. We have to kill the blasphemer. We have to kill the one who just won't walk in the way we say he needs to walk. He's, you know, he's a blasphemer. This has been with us now for over 1,500 years. The image of the beast is the church. How diabolical, how diabolical is that? Balaam, the prophet, the false prophet, teaches false doctrine and sexual immorality. Characteristics of the false church. So we're growing now in our understanding of who the beast is, who we are, because we are the beast and only the beast until we repent of our sins, acknowledge Jesus Christ as our Savior, and begin to walk in his ways. The beast is man. The head of the beast are the rulers of men, the conquerors of men, the political leaders of men. The beast that rises from the earth is a false prophet and the image of the beast are the churches that we have made. And now we should be able to understand why almost everything that we've been taught is a lie. Who would ever have thought 
these things. So how can we know the truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus will teach you the truth little by little, precept upon precept. So take these things, and now with a new understanding, read your Bible and begin to understand the truth and the ways of the mighty God that we serve.